Okay, let's do it. So today I'm speaking to Marvin Kamara, former Wimbledon, MK Dons and Cardiff City footballer. How's it going, mate? You okay? Not bad, Dan. Not bad at all. Thank you. Finished the working day, so I've got this and I'm going to tuck into the dinner. But no, yeah, I'm doing well. Thank you. I love it. Appreciate your time. Talk to me then. Like, how are you? How's life at the minute? It's good. It's really good. Um, yeah, I just had a little one. That's my second one. Um, you know, work is going really well. Uh, family life is going really well. So I, I cannot complain, in fact. Probably the happiest I've, I've ever been in my life. And that includes, you know, obviously the, the playing days. It's, life is, is good. I, God has really blessed me over the last few years. Oh, that's good to hear, man. And congrats on the little ones. What did you have, a little boy or a Thank girl? You. A girl, two girls. Um oh. Yeah, the player's curse from, you know, I think uh, retribution from my terrible younger years. But no, two lovely girls, absolute <laughs> legends. Uh, one's quite old now, she's 12. The other one is, she's a baby, like five, six months. So, um, no, it's good. Oh, brilliant. And you mentioned work there. So, like, what what's work? What are you up to nowadays? Yeah, um, so after football, uh, fell into the weird and wonderful world of recruitment. Uh, started my own recruitment company back in 2015. Uh, been doing that for the last seven, coming up eight years. Um, and that's going really well. We've got an office in London, uh, office in Boston and America as well. Next year, planning to open up an office in Singapore. But yeah, it's it's been fantastic over the last couple of years. We've really gone from strength to strength. We employ just south of 50 people now. Um um, so as I say, some in the UK, some in America, plans to kind of grow that to around 70 people by the end of the year. Um, but yeah, it's gone gone really, really well. Wow, that sounds amazing. And I see like from a company perspective, I, I see you online and I see it seems like a a very kind of much team kind of fun orientated environment that you've got within the office there. So talk to me about that. Yeah, definitely. I think it's fair to say that that uh, one of my business partners, he he's plays football, he played football as well. He was at Arsenal as a youth. Uh, and his son is actually is, is a really good player. Keep an eye out for him. Kieran Petri, he's at QPR at the moment. He's phenomenal. Really good player. Yeah. One for the future. One for the future. So keep an eye out for him. But yeah, he, he's an ex-sportsman as well. And I think uh, you know a lot of our, of our um, staff are kind of sports people from varying backgrounds. We've got some hockey, some football, uh, some kind of swimmers, athletics. But I think all in all, the the ethos and, and the culture that we're trying to create is one of team, mm. very much uh, based off of the mantra from um, the New Zealand rugby team of kind of no dickheads. So, you know, I think yeah. sport underpins kind of what we're trying to achieve in yeah. terms of uh, clarity in terms of team ethic, in terms of, of kind of all of our values are, are based off of some of the behaviours and the experiences that myself and, and, and the rest of the board had in, in sport. Mm, interesting. And you mentioned recruitment. Talk to me about like recruitment. What made you go down that avenue? Is there, is there any industry that would have me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I came out of, after when I came out of football, um, I didn't really know what to do. I had no worldly experience. I had no clue. My peer group were all footballers, um, so they had no idea of what real life was. And it was a journey that I went on. Um, I tried various odd jobs. Can you believe it? You know, coming out of playing championship and, and league one football, um, I found myself when I was out of contract at Huddersfield, I think it was a couple months after that, you know, when the penny started to dry up, um, that I got my first job. And that first job was kind of selling door-to-door Wi-Fi. So I was kind of knocking on people's doors. At the time, I was I was in Yorkshire. Yeah. It was it was the winter, and as you can imagine, I was in the rural parts of Yorkshire as a black man knocking on people's doors <laughs> in the dark. I think I quit that job after two three weeks when I got the police called on me like twice in three weeks. I was like, this really? is for me. <laughs> I quit oh. that job quite quite quickly. Um, but then you know, as you say, when when you know a lot of lads that come out of football will probably tell you the same thing when you don't have a clue kind of what your skill sets are or, or even what a real job is or what it takes mm. to be successful in a real job. I kind of batted around a couple of times um, trying to find my feet in life. And I think I was quite fortunate at the time that, you know, a lot of my best mates uh, were in the Premier League. So financially, you know, where I would have had a lot more pressure on me, they were able to support me during that transition period. 
Mm. Um, but it, but it got, you know, it gets to the point as a as a man that you, or as a, not even a man, as a, as a human, that you you have some kind of self pride, and I could no longer take money off them. So realized that I needed to find my feet and find my feet quickly to get kind of a, a salary, a paid job coming in. Mm. And kind of just fell on fell on recruitment. Um, got a job at a company called Venquis. Mm. Had to move back in with my mother. I just had a, my daughter at the time, so as you can imagine, there were a lot of pressures um, yeah. at that time. But you know, had to eat humble pie, move back in with with the parents, and start from the ground up. You know, there was a lot of people in the company and in, in the recruitment company who were younger than I was, obviously were more experienced than I was. So, mm. um, you know, were, were were more senior than me in the organisation, but. You know that that first year was a was a kind of a massive learning curve. I think I nearly lost my job twice, treating really? it like a, yeah, just you know the football banter that didn't go down well in the office. This I won't tell any of the stories that nearly got 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 me got me got me fired. But wow. there were a couple of instances that would have been considered banter in the changing room, but yeah, yeah it didn't go down well well with my bosses at the time. So I was yes. told a couple of times this isn't a, this, yeah, this isn't a football ground. You need to behave yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a steep learning curve, but thankful, you know, I came out the other side and and found myself where I am today. That's amazing, and that's like a massive kind of achievement to obviously start from, like you said, the ground up essentially, and you had to obviously make a lot of amendments in your your kind of your, your general life, really moving back in with the parents and and obviously starting from there, and obviously you've gone into the workplace and essentially it has worked out because now you've kind of moved on from that as a result of gaining that initial experience so you mentioned before as part of your transition process you were kind of getting some help from like your friends who were like still playing uh, within the game um did you like did you get any help from any organizations or any kind of anyone else that may oh, have no, made that the transition? Was... no that was the worst part about it you know is it, you're kind of on an island in terms of that because particularly if you come out early you know a lot of my mates that come out now I'm able to help them you know if they want to call me I'm able to give them that guidance but at the time I was still fairly young I think I was 26 27 mm. when I came out so majority of the people who I'd grown up with were, were still playing and you know as much as they want to help they just don't have the the, the worldly experience to yeah. be able to help and I think on the other side you have friends who do have jobs but they're not able to really help and help you navigate that kind of mental transition that you're trying to go through yeah. and you, you really don't know what a, what a good job is you have no clue what's your worth salary wise mm. what your skill set you have no clue and and at the time I don't know if it's changed but the the FA and the PFA were, were, were kind of zero help um mm. there was no numbers that I felt I could call or that I knew of that I could call to say what on earth do I do you know, I went to the job centre when it got really hard and I went on kind of job seekers allowance. I'll never forget that. I went to, I wasn't, I didn't have a driving licence at the time and I went to the job centre and kind of mm. told them the situation. I've never, I don't have a CV, never had a job, never interviewed for a job. Who can mm. I speak to? And in fact, the reason I went on to job seekers was because when I went to seek this help, I was told they, they couldn't help me because I, I wasn't on the dole. I wasn't on job seekers and so no one could help me. I just had to go and use a computer to find a job. And I was like, well, I've never found, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so I ended up going on the dole to try and get some support. That was a waste of time. Um, I'd go for weekly interviews. I think at the time they were paying me like £56 a week. Yeah. And I was going to my interviews and I, I had no driving license. And the, the lady who I was speaking to sat me down. And I was like, oh, what about this job as a delivery driver? I was like, I don't, I don't have a driving license. <laughs> Went back the following week, the same lady sits me down what about a job as a, as like a delivery driver? I went, I told you last week, I don't have a license. Oh, wow. <laughs> so at that point, I was thinking, I'm on my own. These people aren't going to help me yeah. to find a job. But as I say, you know, I was getting the, the £56 a week. Um, and believe it or not, you know, uh, uh, that was a massive help to me and able to kind of buy even just the basics for, for my daughter in terms of food. Mm. Um and uh, then I was fortunate enough to go back into semi-pro football where okay, I wasn't earning a lot, but that £200 a week meant I was doing 250 a week kind of cash. Yeah. So that £1,000 a week, I was able to just just about, um, you know, put put food on the table. And as I say, I was living at my, my parents, um, so I didn't have to pay for accommodation. But if I had had to pay for accommodation, it could have been 
you know, a lot different. So, uh, you know, thankful for the fact that I had family to fall back on at the time um, I can go and, and live with. And as I say, that the, the, the small amount of money that I was making at the time, I was able to put food on the table. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I got my first job and, and that was really where I started to understand what real life was, what it took to kind of be successful. Mm. And you no, know, I, I take away nothing from the experiences that I went through because it's it shaped who I am today. And it, yeah. it, in fact, you know, the company that, that, that I own with my business partners, 100% wouldn't wouldn't be where it was without kind of the resilience and the skills that I'd learned during my playing years and kind of the resilience that I learned from my non-playing years as well during those transition years. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm I'm thankful for all of those experiences because, you, know, you know, I remember a certain time, um, which was a dark period when I promised myself, you know, I would never, ever put myself in this situation financially again. You know, and if if you know, God saw it fit to, to give me money again, I would manage that money correctly. Um, and you know, as I say, those are the things that now that the business is doing well. That that kind of the principles that I, that I guide myself by, in terms of not getting carried away, um, living un, under your means, not even to your means. Um, you know, not feeling that there's I have to compete with anyone. Um, in terms of material things. They're not important, you know. I know they're not important because I've seen multi-millionaires, footballers lose everything, and mm. you know the thing they don't want, they don't, they don't wish for any of that stuff back. Is they just want to be able to provide for their family. So, yeah. you know, I, I know that you know, no, regardless of how successful I become now, you know, stuff doesn't matter. It's you know being able to put bread on the table, but having make sure you got a roof over your head. You know, the odd holiday here or there is. Is nice. Those are the things that I kind of cherish. Ask me that again if I win the Euro Mills, then might have a different answer. But yeah, yeah, that's it. I get it. No, that's hundred percent resonate with that. And sometimes it's difficult um, because you can get attracted to those shiny things, and sometimes you can find yourself not comparing yourself as such to other people, but just looking and seeing, oh, like maybe the grass is greener over there or they look like they're having fun or they look they look like they're really successful. And you never know what people are going through. Um, yeah. Especially on social media. Um, it's always a yeah, 100%. smoke and mirrors and things like that. But essentially, um, it, it, it can be done. Um, obviously, time and effort and good surroundings, surround yourself with good people and just the motivation to do it. And it's not always easy, um, as you know. So you've kind of done all of that and then... Like, what was the motivation for going into starting your own business, essentially? Yeah, I think it was just that drive to, to be successful. Um, and as I say, I I think, you know, when you play football, you're ingrained with that natural competitive nature. You know, that, that forms part of who you are, whether you like it or not. It's just in you to compete. So, you know, when I started to work for someone else, um, I think the reason, and I, I speak to it about my, with my junior staff now, I talk to them about it because I've got young, you know, a lot of young people that come out of of sport or even just generally really competitive individuals, and I, and I talk about my own journey um, when I was working for someone else, and the reason that I was successful was that in my own mind, as I say, I was able to kind of gamify what I was doing. Uh, and that gamification was a meant I was engaged every day, um, but b meant that I ultimately rose to the top. And you know, I saw everyone in the company at the time, yes, as a teammate, but it was almost like, like I, I, I treated I treated it like a football team, where you know, together we're going to be successful, we're going to win. But I see you all wanting to play in my position, and mm-hmm. you know, if if we have a teammate, you like them. If they if you play in the same position, you got to outperform them. Um, and and that's how I I looked at, at work. You know, I was there that these these people were my colleagues. You know, they were my peers. But I had to outperform them, and and that is what I would do on a daily basis. I would kind of micro game everything, CVs, um, call times. I was always comparing myself to the people who, particularly the people who were the top performers. I would always look at their outputs and say, right, I have to beat them. And mm. if I beat them on a daily basis, I know ultimately you know, the rest of my core skills would, would come would come out. And, and that's what happened. I ended up finding myself, you know, being one of the, the, the better individuals in the organisation. Um, 
and as I say, that's what kind of gave me the confidence to 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 go out and start on my own. Um, and you know, it wasn't easy. There were many times in in those first few years when I did take the company up. Um, it, you know, I think what was really good was going from being a footballer and seeing my friends going from being a footballer being to being completely broke. Mm-hmm. That experience really helped me in the early years of of the company because. I think quite quickly it got to the point where we, we, it was small in the first few years and the company was making, I think, anywhere between kind of 30 to 50K a month. Mm. Uh, so in my head, I was like, oh, I'm doing really well. But that was the kind of company's money. It wasn't my money. I still had the bank sending me texts to say insufficient funds in your bank account. Right. But I had a I had a bigger vision that this money that the company was making was going to all be reinvested so that I could scale it. And, you know, that's what I, that's what I was doing. So that was quite difficult for me to navigate in my mind, the fact that, you know, I was making kind of anywhere between 30 to 50K a month. But uh, personally, I had no money. It was quite a, quite a weird situation. Yeah. Um, but I had the bigger picture in mind that, you know, that that money would go towards paying staff, um, it would go towards offices and, and that's what we did you know after the I think two years um, of me kind of being by myself um, I had enough money in the bank that I could with confidence go and employ the first couple of people mm. um, so that's what happened you know we got the first few staff uh, and then we moved into a small office in London Bridge for about five there was death, death for five people mm. um, but that was built off of, as I say, the years of sacrifice that myself and my family made um, with not going on holiday or even when we did go on holiday, I was working okay. every single day. Yeah, every single day I was working on holidays. Um, I didn't take for the first probably four years of the company. Uh, every single holiday, I split my time between working and time with the family. Mm. Um, but those were the sacrifices, as I say, that, you know, that they made and, and that I made um with the view that the company would eventually um you know become successful uh, and i i met some people back in 2019 that that kind of saw and i believe the energy that that i'd been putting in attracted those people mm. and they ended up joining on the, joining us on the journey uh, and as i say forming the board that we have together now and you know since then have gone from strength to strength so say operating now in 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 um well in fact we place people all across the uk and europe and have offices in london and america mm. uh, and soon to be singapore so you know those those early year sacrifices were were you know proved worth it luckily that's amazing that's a massive story it's just, that's really interesting and insightful so i mean if there's anyone out there looking for for inspiration with regards to any business eventually that you want to kind of get involved in then there it is just there in a nutshell. Um, you mentioned kind of that natural competitive nature that you've got and most of us have got as an athlete or former athlete anyway. Have you got any other like transferable skills that you've taken from being a professional footballer into what you're doing now? Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things that that um, have, have been kind of good stead, which is, uh, yeah, we, we mentioned kind of that competitive edge and that competitive nature, but I think... The, the biggest thing was the kind of the resilience. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we're used to losing or having a bad session and having to bounce back and perform again. And I think I was able, and I actually can think of a specific example when I first started working for the company Venquist. There was a guy who started with me. We started, I think, on the same day. And obviously, in those early years, uh, sorry, those early days when you're kind of consciously incompetent, you know, you know exactly what it is you don't know. Mm. Um, you know things were happening and and kind of he was taking them a lot harder than I was you know I, w- I was taking them hard but I think I was able to to put them within context and and come back again and again and I think he he struggled with that um he ended up leaving after like four months okay uh, four or five months I ended up obviously staying on and and, and doing well at the organization mm. but I think you know that that was definitely ingrained in me from playing football all across all those years the amount of times yeah. I played terrible <laughs> had to go and turn my face into the train in the next day and, and you know put a brave face on and, and go again mm. you know that was it was water for ducks back to me by the time yeah. I went into into the world of business because I was used to it and as I say though I realized that things that, I, that, that were um didn't go my way I have another opportunity to put them right so it wasn't an issue for me to, to be able to go back and, and do it again. Mm. Wow, that's great. And um, with regards to like 
from a broader scale now. Um, I, let's just maybe focus on football as opposed to yeah. all sport in general. But it also encompasses all sport. Um, do you think retirement should be approached in a different way? So back in our day, when whenever like someone spoke about retirement, it was always seen as a bit of a negative kind of conversation for me. You never really wanted to talk about it or think about yeah. it. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I think uh, retirement injury all, all the same thing there's a certain stigma that's attached to it and I think because you know football in particular is so thrust in in the in the public eye mm. and I think as you approach that retirement you you're quite mindful that you're no longer going to be that thing and I think you know we we kind of shy away from it and we don't talk about it it's almost um like the whole mental health thing when we encourage people to talk about it and Things. I think you know retirement should be celebrated. You've done a bloody good job for yeah. staying in football for however long you stayed in it, whether it be two years as a pro, three years, five years, fifteen, twenty years. We we are a minority. We're less than the one percent, you know, mm. who have who've actually stepped onto a professional football field. So we should hold pride in that and and realize that before us there were thousands of footballers who have gone on, and in fact the majority of footballers have gone on to be just fine. Yes, you hear about the, 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 the incidents where, you know, people really struggle, gambling, drug, you hear about that, of course. Mm. But if you if you narrow it down to a mean average, the majority of us, whatever level we play that, whether it be Premier League or League Two, mm. we're just fine. You know, it takes yeah. us a while to find our feet. Mm. But the majority of stories that you will hear, people, I, I would wager the large percentage, particularly in the lower leagues, mm. are happier you know, after they finish playing football, when they've got their families, they're, they're, you know, they're settled down, they know what they're doing, they're able to manage their finances, they don't have the pressures of being a footballer and what and everything that comes with that. I'd wager the vast majority are happier if you ask them now, you know, and, and I, certainly I am. Um, you know, don't get me wrong, there are things about the sport that I miss, um, you know, my, my teammates, training ground banter, I miss all of that stuff, but... You know, I don't miss the the pressures that come with it, the falsehoods that come with it, the the, the narrow-minded individuals you meet, um, you know, on the street or, you know, who want to be around you because you're a footballer. And, you know, I saw it. Literally, when I was at Cardiff and we were top of the championship, the amount of people who all of a sudden found my phone number again was astounding. Yeah. And then the amount of those same people were the people that lost my phone number quite quickly, you yeah. know, when I got when I went to Port Vale and Huddersfield, you know. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 I was mindful of that. Obviously, I'd seen the hangers on from, from my mates and who were playing higher than myself. So I knew what yeah. was going on. Mm. Um, but I don't miss that stuff, you know. I don't miss uh, um, snakes. So to speak, and the and the game is I still see it. I still the, the big players, you know, and I see the people around them, and I can spot them a mile off. Yeah. I, I only have to speak to them once, and I'm like, I know who you are. Mm. Um, but I don't miss any of that, you know, the the, the falsities, having to smile at pe- people when you're in a group, and you don't, you know, they're a hanger on, mm. but you're just like, whatever, you know. But I don't miss any of that stuff. I don't miss it. Sure. And then obviously you played at a decent level, like Championship and, and League One. For a period of time yeah. and then to the latter stages of your career you kind of filtered down the leagues which is pretty normal yeah. anyway. I, I pretty much did the same thing um yeah how did you find it going like from a mental perspective and also like a physical one uh obviously performing yeah at a decent level and having to drop down and obviously cater for for that particular level how did you find that I, I wasn't able to manage it to be honest and i think you know i can look back and speak pragmatically about it i think that was a bit of arrogance. In fact, it wasn't a bit of arrogance. It was arrogance that, uh, the, you know, coming from Championship and League One, which isn't even the highest league. So how dare I, if I look back on it now, mm. and you know, and even when I when I think about it, you know, there are boys playing in in the Conference Conference South who were more than good enough to play at League One or Championship level, or even Premier League level. Yeah. But for whatever reason, they haven't had the rub of the green. But there are some really good bloody players at those those levels. But you know, my assumption was, A, that I would go in and walk it because I was a championship or a League One player, uh, but also, B, that I didn't have to try as hard. And I quite quickly found myself struggling. And when you get in that in that rut, it's very difficult to come out. And I didn't have the, the energy 
if I'm being completely honest, to get myself out of that rut. I was disillusioned with the game. Mm. Um, I felt it owed me something and it spit me out. So my heart wasn't in it. So, mm. you know, I wasn't, I wasn't able to perform at any level. I look at all the, the non-league clubs or, or the, the lower league clubs that I played for. And I think, you know, I did myself and them a disservice if I look back on it, because I went there half-hearted thinking I'll just turn up and then it would work. Mm. But, you know, I got found out pretty quickly in, at all of those clubs and rightly so. Because I think there were boys there that were, were grafting. You know, they still had that eye of the tiger, so to speak. I definitely didn't have it. You know, they wanted to go on and do something. And there were players that I played with, you know, at Grimsby, um, at, at Forest Green, all over, that have gone on, went on to have great careers. But at the time, I kind of all viewed everyone in there as like a lower league football. You know, it was so narrow-minded when I look back on it. But as I say, you know, there are, there are people playing in those leagues today that are more than good enough to play in the Premier League, 100%. Yeah. And there were players that I played with who ended up to have good careers in the championship in the Premier League who I know I was better than. And I wasn't even a very good footballer, let's be honest. I wasn't. But I know I was better than some. But they had great careers in, mm-hmm. in because because they tried and yeah. they worked their bloody socks off. Um, so, yeah, you know, I look back on it and, yeah, my journey in, in the lower leagues. So if there is anyone who comes out of who's watching this who's dropped from League One or Championship or Premier League, finds themselves in League Two, Conference, whatever. If you want to do it and you want to get back up there, it's definitely possible, but you need to have the right attitude. You've got to, you know, you've got to train just as hard, in fact, not harder than you were when you were there to get yeah. back where you were. Um, but, you know, that's, as I say, that's something that I didn't have in me. I, I'd lost that eye of the tiger by the time I, by the time I left Huddersfield. I was, yeah, I was done. I was done. I should have hung up my boots then, to be honest. <laughs> No, nah, it is difficult, and uh, like you said, I, I've said this for, for years now, even when I was playing kind of in the lower echelons of football, um, there's so many players there who can play at a high level, um, and it's easy to, especially from the outside looking in when you're not involved in, in the game, to think that or assume that, oh, you're playing in the conference, so you're, you've are you literally just played the conference all your career, yeah. and it's like, no, you've probably filtered down from the leagues above. Um the level there now is, is, is ridiculously high. And sometimes, yeah. even when you watch them on TV, sometimes you don't, it doesn't really show the level to its full ability when you're watching it on TV. But when you're actually, yeah, playing, definitely not. as you know, it, it's difficult, it's fast paced. Um, There's no mugs in, in those leagues. They're all, right. don't get wrong, there are some crap players, but the vast majority yeah. are very good. They're yeah. very, very good. And I think, as you say, you know, when people filter down, if they have, are under any disillusion that they're going to be able to walk it, they'll soon get found out, as I say, what which happened to me. You know, there were players that I was looking at even when I was really, I can't remember what league it was. I want to say Ryman. I want to say the Ryman, Ryman Prem. Mm. And I remember, you know, I was just, I'd look at some players and I'd be like, oh, you are crap. And we would start the game and they'd be <laughs> running rings around me. And I'd be like, what on earth is going on? Um, but, you know, I think it's a say, looking back on it now, it was, you know, I'd approached it with, with far too much arrogance and I got what I deserved, you know, which yeah. was nothing. Fair enough. And then moving forward, so do you think there's more help or do you think athletes need more help when it comes to kind of approaching retirement and transitioning from sports to another career? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know what the infrastructure is like now because I'm so far removed from the sport. But, you know, if it was anything like it was for me, and I, actually I speak to some some recent players who have come out not too long ago, they, they are, have struggled with that transition for the same reasons that, that we mentioned. So I don't, it's probably not there. Um, they probably say it is, but I, I don't know what the, what the FA or the PFA do now for, 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 for guys coming out. But I think there's so many now that come out you know, on, on the, however the long the cycles are, is it, what is it, twice a season? There are so many that come out, it's, it's difficult. And, I, you know, I don't, I make no bones about how difficult it is to be able to support every single individual who comes out because, you know, a lot of these players, I'm going to say probably the majority of these players probably have aspirations to continue playing or probably think they are going to be the one who's going to get another contract. So yeah. probably in the first of that support. And by the time they realise they need it, there's another tranche of players who are coming out. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't say it, say it likely about the PFA and the FA that it's a difficult job. It yeah. is a difficult job. And I think if it's going to be done correctly, 
they need to invest probably a, a lot heavier in terms of fiscally than they are right now. And I think that's probably the thing that because you're not seeing those returns on that money, mm-hmm. but I think the game has so much money in it now, they have a duty of care to the players to actually put a proper fund together to say, right, there's an, or, an organisation mm-hmm. backed by the FA, their sole job is player support coming out of football. Mm-hmm. And that's going to be a lot of money, right? Where does that money come from? That's probably the thing that, that <laughs> the question that, that needs to be asked. But as you say, there's so much money in the sport now, I'm pretty sure they can afford a couple of mil to put, to put a, a season, a year, to put something together that mm-hmm. their sole purpose is to look after so that every single player that comes out of football knows when the time's right, when they know that you're not going to get that contract. Because I say we all have harbour that hope, right? We're going to go mm. on trial or whatever. So yeah. you, you get released, you have that summer, you're still remaining fit. You go to pre-season, you might go to this club for two weeks, that club for two, three weeks, whatever. Maybe you get a short-term contract. Doesn't mm. work out, fall out. So, you know, you look at a six-month period, the season after, that you're still trying to, to find your feet. And to say, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of people don't make it. But they mm. need to know. They need to know when you don't. Here's a number. Yeah. Call that number. The organisation is going to talk to you. They're going to interview you. They're going to give you everything you need in terms of CV prep writing. And they're going to put you in touch with recruitment agencies, help you find what your passions are, training courses, whatever they might be. We're going to put you in and we're going to help fund these courses for you to be a, you know, that's what needs to happen. There needs mm-hmm. to be a proper infrastructure put in place because it's, it's what, hundreds, thousands annually that fall out of the game at from the age of 16 to the age of, I think the main, the, the majority of footballers come out of football, I heard something about 26, 27, okay. you know, when they, when they don't. So between the ages of 26, 27, but for everyone, you know, from the ages of 16 to 35, mm-hmm. there needs to be a proper or, or beyond. There needs to be a proper infrastructure in place that players know where to go, mm. you know, and it, and not, you know, a couple of organisations, but at least one that's funded by the FA, this is where you go. When yeah. you realise, because the penny drops for all of us, yeah. this isn't going to happen anymore. Yeah. When that penny does, does drop, this is the number you call. And these yeah. guys will support you all the way through to you getting your first job and your first paycheck. They will help you. Mm. Whether that's with mental support, counselling, um, as you say, actual skill training, it needs to offer the whole suite, not just supporting on on the job mm. um, in terms of finding a job, but that mental transition. There's going to be counselling. It's almost a form of of uh, you know, I don't want to say grief support, but you know what I mean. A, a, yeah. a, someone who because it's a loss, right? You lose something. It, yeah. There's a bereavement there. You lose you lose who you are so mm-hmm. you need that that support or that at least the avenue of support for someone to say right we're going to help you find yeah. yourself again get back to your center and go again for your next stage of life definitely and i think from a player's perspective that would help them anyway to know that whilst they're playing that number or that organization 100%. or that infrastructure is there for them to utilize so i think that would be beneficial 100 percent. moving forward like have you got any advice, just in brief, have you got any advice that you would give to any kind of, say, sportsman, footballer, um, with regards to their approach to transition? Yeah, I would just say, you know, keep your head up and realise it. Just hold on to that because you will find yourself eventually. Mm. Like, I have no doubt about it. And, and you will be happier once you do. Then you know you okay. You won't recreate some of the the, the moments that you have in football, but there is football way way more. There are so many beautiful things out there, so many beautiful people that you will meet, um, and that you will have great times with. And and you know hold on to that, know that. And as I say, talk. Don't hold it in like like we speak about any kind of you know mental um, challenge that you're going through. The, I think the most important thing is to speak. Uh, and reach out to your teammates, former teammates, friends who you've probably even lost contact with. And mm. don't be ashamed to say, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. Is mm. there anyone you could put me in touch with? Is there, I, you know, I'm most recently back uh, you know, in, in, in touch with one of my best mates, and he's going through a moment at the moment, but he has me, and I'm able to yeah. um, help him. Even yeah. in it, and this isn't in terms of giving him money. This is in terms of just advice from, yeah. from the experience that I have, even little things 
like you know his mortgage you know he was paying a ridiculous interest rate on his mortgage but mm. i was able to tell him you're, you're, you're paying the wrong interest rate here contact this person change yeah. it which he did and he ended up saving himself five six hundred pound a month wow. these are the things as i say we don't have we don't have yeah. an avenue kind of information because we're not taught any of this mm. we don't know it and as i say you might be a footballer who's come out of the game who's as i say paying 1500 quid interest but you don't know that you're probably on the wrong product but you yeah. don't know that because these are things that we don't we don't focus on but um yeah i think just speak that is the biggest thing that i would say to them and, and hold your head up you are more than football awesome love that and um again really appreciate your time really enjoyed the chat you want to just let everyone know kind of where we can find you on social and obviously the company and, and where we can locate the company as well yeah, yeah, so I don't have a personal social media, but uh, the company is Valum Associates. Mm-hmm. Give us a follow, everyone. Uh, show some love. Um, we're based in Monument in the city uh, and Boston, Massachusetts in the states. But yeah, you can you can all hit us up on on the social media. On we're on Instagram, on LinkedIn. So yeah, please do give us a follow. Love that. Like I said, really appreciate your time. Keep up the good work. We'll keep in touch. I'm sure along the way, uh, I'll be hitting yeah, you up for some advice and stuff. Yeah, keep up the good work and uh, yeah, hopefully speak to you soon. Have a good evening all. See you later, mate. Take care, bud.